<laughs> well, welcome everyone. It is week two of our Gospel of Mark Bible study. We are covering uh, verses, chapters five through eight. We did one through four. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can actually pick that up and see the course um, and kind of catch it its entirety. We're recording this and then we'll upload it, but we're honored to have you here if you're watching virtually. Amy and Allison, thank you for being here. Um, we'll start with our collect uh, for scriptures. This is the uh, from Proper 28, the Sunday closest to November 16th, uh, one of Thomas Cranmer's greatest gifts to us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, um, before we launch into uh, into the chapters 5 through 8, did you guys have any questions or observations you wanted to make of 1 through 4? Or if you read ahead a little bit, 5 through 8, if you have any questions that you wanted to tender before we start in. You got anything, Allison? No, I'm good. I, I uh, just finished today um, what we went over last week, and I'm ready to go tonight now, the new new phase. <laughs> okay. Amy, how about you? Did you, get, did you have any questions? No. Oh, wonderful. Wow, that good a class. I'm very grateful. All right. Well, we're ready to go. Here we are. It is time for the week two section. Now, the, the week two... <sighs> You can't, you know, I'm, 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 I've done an arbitrary breaking of one through four, five through eight, um, nine through 11, and then 12 through 16, because that there are 16 chapters and we're doing a four week course with that. And looking at it in that way, the gospel of Mark can be broken into different sections. And where we are today is it's a question of authority. You know, who, who basically empowered Jesus to teach in the way he's teaching to speak in the way he's speaking, and then to do the things he's doing. I know that sounds very um, sort of, you know, bound up in itself. It's a sort of a tautological arg argument, but it it really kind of presents itself in that way so that if we link up the things that Jesus is doing or saying and the questions people are asking about him, you can see some pretty interesting patterns develop. And the core of it is around not only who is the savior, but, but what is the business of the savior in the world that people are inhabiting at that moment? It's a very, as I said, you know, it's a very contemporary, very present minded gospel. And I think in light of everything we're going through right now in our world today, post pandemic in an era where it seems wars are breaking out all over the place in an era of climate change and shifts in an era of a lot of tumult, we have very presently minded questions, existential questions we're not so much involved and engaged in um in the in the in the terminus of history in in the in the fulfillment of time but in what's happening and fulfilling now in our midst what's happening in the present moment so what i find fascinating about uh the gospel of mark and continue to be excited about is exactly that so as we move through this, we may feel a shift in the, to the past tense just because this is a story that's been written and we're telling each other and it happened a couple thousand years ago. But I think it's really important to kind of be in it as if it's just happening, if it's just, up, if it's just unfolding before us. So try to hold that in mind as we start to work our way through these different scenes, these different conversations that Jesus is having as he's teaching and interacting with his disciples. We have this amazing moment sort of off camera where John's uh, arrest and fate are kind of exposed. The scandal of, of his death are, is exposed. And that presents itself as, a, as something that begs the question, um, not only of who is this Jesus in relationship to John, but who is this Jesus in relationship to us? And we get to a very important point for us as people of St. Peter, which is the confession of Peter. It also sets up beautifully what's going to happen next week, which I don't want to tease too much because we're at the very beginning of this class and it would seem silly to put the cart before the horse, but here we go. So we're going to go into chapter five tonight and 
five, if I was going to pick a theme for it, I have a friend who's a preacher. He says, if I ever titled my sermons, which he doesn't, and then he immediately brings out a title. So I think one of the titles that I would present in chapter five is what is clean and what is unclean? Because Jesus has interactions with people throughout this chapter that present to him challenges of interacting with folks that of in that time would be seen as unclean. A man who is struggling with profound upset within his own psyche. Uh, he is possessed by demons, by legion, actually, a legion of demons. He is overcome and overwhelmed with these, these vexing spirits to the extent that uh, he's become almost not only superhuman, but preternaturally uh, terrifying to the people around him. He he literally lives in the tombs, and um, and his exorcism, and the the discovery of him in his right mind, puts people in a place not where they're able to celebrate his healing, but rather they're terrified. What kind of power? What kind of authority has this kind of influence? We bring it down a notch and kind of dial it back with the with the interaction of Jesus with two very profoundly affecting women. One is a woman with an issue of blood, which we re may remember not, or not from Sunday school times, because it's paired with Jairus' daughter, who was a Roman soldier who um, and a leader of the synagogue who was uh, had a daughter who was dying and the challenge of that as well. And then finally, with that resuscitation, not resurrection, but resuscitation, um, we hear and see some things about what it is to be in contact with the dead. So we have possession, we have the uncleanliness of a wound with an issue of blood, a hemorrhage, and then finally we have a dead body. Um, these are all people that no teacher of the law should be anywhere near, much less touch, and touch becomes very important. So let's talk about the exorcism of the Gadarene or the Gerasene demoniac. Um, here's a guy who lives in the tombs. Um, the ancient commentators had uh, a great deal of uh, to say about this. You know, there's there's Peter Chrysologus, there's Prudentius, um, Origen as well. There's also a commentary on John that is very famous by by uh, by another scholar talking about how this person who lives amongst the tombs is is in this liminal space of torment um, and 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 what i find provocative about this is that we're going from some and i'm going to put this you know healing light moments where you know there's a leprous person who's cleansed there's a person with a withered hand who stretches forth his his hand and and, and receives um dexterity again uh Peter's mother-in-law gets lifted up out of her sickbed so she can make dinner for the disciples. A bit of a bit of a, some weak tea in that. But here is somebody who is absolutely terrifying. You see in the picture there, he's wearing shackles. He they did everything they could to try to help him. They bound him with chains to try to keep him from harming himself or other people. Um, they they tried to force him to maintain himself they would they would bind him and try to clean him up and, and make him okay and presentable he would break the chains and beat them and drive them off and and he he literally lived amongst the dead a sort of a imagine a charnel sort of existence where you know the only people that he's around um are dead ones and they're in bits and bobs um this is this is something out of a halloween nightmare and here he, you know, here he is there. There's everyone has tried to help him. Everyone has failed. Jesus arrives having crossed the sea. If you remember from chapter four, the stilling of the storm and all that, and finds a man who is in the midst of the storm inside himself. He is, he is raving and raging and more so the demons again, recognize Jesus and cry out to him and say, who are you? And what do you have to do with us? Um, and he demands their name and then uh, resolves to cast them out. They beg to be cast out into a herd of swine, which then go off and drown themselves. So just a terrifying episode. I mean, can you imagine being a witness to this? Um, it would, the, the level of shock and awe would have been overwhelming. 
And the, the swine herd runs away and tells everybody in town about this. Now, here's an important thing to know about swine. They are not kashrut. They are not edible according to the law of God. The only reason someone would be tending swine, likely for two purposes. The first was as a, a capital investment, whereby they were intending to sell them for uh, for sacrifice in the temple of Zeus, say. The other thing is they would be selling them for the market to feed the Hellenists, the Greeks, and the Romans. No Jewish person would eat pork. So we're already dealing with you know, not only of the liminal space of, of the gathering demoniac, we're also dealing with the liminal presence of pigs in the first place. Um, they're not clean. And something that is unclean is being cast into thing that is unclean. And then the unclean thing is ending itself. So the swine herd runs off to tell everybody. This is disruptive to the community, of course. And everyone comes out to see what just happened. This is now a spectacle. And what do they find? Or what do they expect to find? They expect to find Jesus yet again being one of the Gadarenes' victims, if you will. And instead, they encounter him in his right mind. In some depictions, he is bathed and clean. Um, they've combed out his hair, which has been entangled knots. They've taken off his shackles, and he's speaking reasonably. So there's a question you guys can answer. Which would you find more alarming? Someone who has been so profoundly mentally ill and affecting in their right mind all of a sudden like a light switch or a bunch of pigs floating in the sea after having heard the swineherd's testimony? I'm curious if you want to answer that. That would be great. Which would you find more alarming? I think the man. The um, man? The pigs, yeah. Yeah. Well, from now, because in the Bahamas, they do have pigs that swim, so. It's, <laughs> it's true, yeah. So so I'm accustomed to seeing that. So, you know, it's, it's a, but, but the other, the, um, the insanity that is, that, that's, that's disruptive to a lot of people, you know. It I, is. That's the right word, I don't know if it's the right word. I think, I think, but no, Alton, you know, yeah. yeah, disruptive yeah. is actually that, because again, you're, you're dealing with something that, yeah. that, that that upsets the apple cart of our expectations uh, and and expectations kind of define us define our comfort levels i know it sounds horrible to wish ill on a person but at least they're consistent with what yeah. we know about them but this is what they've been doing all through time even the 1700s 1800s they would uh some uh, have them in the insane asylum they'd shackle them and they'll leave them filthy and in yeah. corners in the dark so even back in the uh, biblical times, still did that. So it's almost like they never really progressed with mental illness. You know, dealing oh, no, with... we're, we're still struggling. But we still are, yeah. yeah. But, but Amy, I mean... how about you? How about you? What do you think? Um, is it, I mean, do you think it's mental illness or do you think it was really possession? I think the answer is yes. I think yeah. that 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 you know one of the things that we we have to take the text at its face value and the face value is possession. We are legion and the legion you know cast us into the swine and we'll be over there. Legion uh, meaning many. Legion right? meaning many, yeah. That that we are le we are legion. That said, at the same time, you know, we also have to and this is where that when I spoke last week about aligning our horizons, you know. We don't often see possession in, in this day and age, um, except in the movie theater or, in, or on the streaming services and great jump scare horror movies abound in that regard. But what we do see is profound mental illness mm. and the yeah, alignment. Yeah, I've worked with mental illness. Yeah. yeah. No. And and we can acknowledge- but You don't that, believe in possession? That people oh, can be possessed? I, listen- you know, I was, I was, as I was preparing for this, one of the lines that kept floating through my head was that line from Hammett: there are more things in heaven and earth, dear Horatio, than are figured in her philosophy. I make no doubt that there is that which is not God, principalities and powers, the dark one, the undoer of things, the accuser, however you want to frame it, we must acknowledge that presence. At the same time, I think the, the core of this is understanding just how 
profoundly affecting this particular healing is, you know, and I also want to emphasize that this is how the chapter starts. And if we pay attention, actually, it only increases in magnitude the the level of 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 dunamis of 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 creative and redemptive and and healing energy that's coming out of Jesus and flowing out of Jesus is being demonstrated because a woman just grazes the hem of his robe the great uh the great Sam Cook song he grazes the hem of her robe and she's healed mm -hmm. and she doesn't even touch his physical body and he doesn't even intend to touch her as he did with you know the others that he's healed this woman merely just grazes the fabric that's attached to him and she experiences healing. And then a dead girl is raised from her bed and returned to not only life, but I know this, you know, real life. Give her something to eat. You know, her body isn't just animate, it's awake. She is taking nourishment. She is, she is a whole person. An odd little tidbit from the ancient days. There was a certainty among folks in this day that if you were not a, a, a real person, if you were a ghost or a, or a sending or, or a seeming, um, you couldn't eat anything. Mm -hmm. um, gods, them, gods themselves and sacrifice, they were given sacrifices. They didn't eat the flesh of the sacrifice. They feasted on the aroma of the roasting meat or the boiling meat. That was how you fed a god is they would they would the the smoke would rise and they would they would nibble on the savor of that so they can't eat but they can smell I, go figure but when he says give her something to eat you know this is jesus kind of rolling through these layers of prohibition of saying don't touch that don't be involved with that don't don't even get engaged with that but this is where jesus goes full in you know, this is where we experience him, which I find very provocative. And it is very provocative. You know, Jesus is being challenged along the way by, by what power do you do these things? By what energy are you creating this stuff? You know, what's going on here? The other thing that's important to remember, and, and I've heard this uh, emphasized again and again, is that Jairus's daughter is resuscitated, which like Lazarus, you know, She's only immediately dead. Your daughter has died. Don't bother. Don't worry. You'll find her. You know, we'll go see her anyway. But then Lazarus is dead four days. And Jesus dies and, is, and, and comes back to life for three days. Whether you want to call it resurrection or not, life returns to someone who is dead. And that's a very significant thing. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this, as you look at this, is that these healings, unlike the ones we're going to encounter in a few moments, these healings, though they are controversial because they involve touching what is unclean or being in a relationship with what is unclean, they don't necessarily have a profound theological impact. They have a, they have a profound social impact. Again, our horizon, not theirs. Theirs, the, the horizon of, of political and social and theological was all in alignment. It was all one thing. We see a distinction. The controversies over healing on the Sabbath or the controversies of healing someone by um, by mingling bodily fluids, we're going to see in a bit, you know, spitting and, and smearing. We're not seeing that. What we're seeing is pure touch, clean, unclean. How, do, how does Jesus walk in that, in that liminal line, that liminal space, the space between? So very profound and provocative chapter. Chapter six gets us into that question of authority, that root question. And Jesus arrives in his hometown and discovers that even though he is being celebrated all around the region, um, he, he isn't really being accepted. Like, isn't this Joseph's son, the son of the carpenter? Don't we, haven't we known him his whole life? Um, you know, he, and he, he remarks in a classic bit of scripture, prophets are not without honor except in their own town. Uh, and he could do no work of greatness in their midst. Great line. It's like these little, these little 
morsels get thrown to us. And I find it, I find it very, you know, engaging. This provokes Jesus to, to, to take his 12 followers, pair them off and send them out two by two to proclaim the good news. And as they go, they find that they are not only able to proclaim this new good word of Jesus's arrival and the kingdom's arrival, but also that they're able to heal the sick and cast out demons. There's an empowerment that goes down Mm -hmm. and this only serves to increase the buzz. So, you know, it's not just the fact that this Jesus, who is a great teacher, is able to express authority and works of, of power and might um, his followers are as well. Imagine that, you know, think about being an authority in those days. And, you know, it's not the, it's not, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you see somebody doing amazing things and they say, wait, why are you doing these amazing things? You said, you think these are amazing. You should meet my teacher. Uh, ter- you know, I was like, you know, that's, that's, that's intense. Nowadays, we call that having a hype man or a hype person, you know, someone who goes literally walks in front of you and kind of hypes you up, you know, builds your presence up so that when you arrive on stage, everybody's primed and ready. So he's got, you know, he's got six parties of two traveling around the region, preaching, teaching, you know, healing, exercising, doing everything that he just did in chapter five on their scale. And now the buzz is going around. And guess who it gets to? Good old Herod. Now, I love this little thing because this is where we break to the aside. And and it's pretty much the only time really in Mark where we have sort of two parallel lines going alongside each other. So you have the mission of the 12 going on while Herod hears about Jesus and his, his party of followers and the impact they're having on the on the Okloy, the crowd. And Herod begins to freak out. He's worried. He's worried that the people are saying that this might be Elijah, one of the great prophets. And he's very worried, very worried that this might be John the Baptist returned from the dead. Why, may you ask, is that? Well, it has to do with his wife and his stepdaughter. You see, he married his brother's wife, and he had, according to the scriptures, a rather inappropriate attention for his stepdaughter. She was basically enjoined by her mother, who was very upset with John condemning uh, Herod for marrying his own sister-in-law and then um, becoming the the stepfather of Herodias, uh, his, his niece. Um, this was not considered appropriate by John. He was preaching against it, which wound up, which wound up with him in prison. Herodias then hatches a plot with her mother to basically set up John and she dances before her father-in-law or her stepfather. Um, he swears that he'll give her anything she wants up to half her king, half his kingdom, which is complete hyperbole. He wouldn't, Herod was too careful and too political. He wouldn't have done that, but bear with, this is a great story. And she says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And he, of course, and this has been said in front of his guests. So he's now bound by honor to do this. So he orders his men to go to John's prison. They cut off his head. They bring it to the platter. And Renaissance painters had a field day with that from the very moment they translated that from um, the Greek into the Latin. And uh, you, you can go online and see many, many, many pictures of John the Baptist's head being presented to Herodias and her mother um, on a platter. So that's how that winds up. And it, you know, it's one of those things where Herod is terrified now, terrified that this Jesus is this, this John the Baptist, this, this itinerant wilderness preacher come back to vex him. So the other thing we have to acknowledge in chapter six, when we talk about the authority of Jesus is anxiety. Who is this Jesus? And what is the impact that this Jesus will have on us, on our community? And and who it is that he is going to provoke us to become? 
And what is that doing to the to the structures of authority that already exist in the day? We have the structure of the scriptures of the Torah. Uh, we have the structure of the scriptures of the priests and the scribes. We have the structures of the Herodian uh, family and dynasty and rulers, going back to the Greeks and uh, and beyond. And then, of course, we have Rome. So we have an awful lot of tension that if, and again, if we take a page from any for everything that's happening in the Holy Land right now, you know, it's all about who's controlling and who's exerting pressure. And those two things push that middle layer of society and compress it when they're used to having more authority and space to move, to live and operate. And it's in within this institutional hierarchy that there's great tension. And Jesus is seen as a disruptor from above. And Herod, we've just seen with John's death, is a, is a disruptor from or just disruptor from below. And Herod is a disruptor from above. And this is compressing and causing tension. And this scandal reveals that. And then, of course, you get to say this. Meanwhile, because remember, we're dealing with two parallel stories right now. We have Jesus doing something that is both miraculous and also very important, not only to advance the story, but also to, to reveal who is this Jesus and by, by what authority is he doing this? And he proceeds in this chapter to feed 5,000 men and others with bread and fish, basically a young boy's lunch, and then turns around after another stilling of the storm and his success out of town to do it again for another 4,000 of men and more. So both ends. Um, the first time they, after the meal, they gather up 12 baskets full of, of leftovers. The second time they gather up seven. Numerology is important in the Bible. And I wish I was a better scholar of numerology, but 12 matters both for the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. 12 is also a very holy number as is four. But in all of these situations, understand that everybody is now able to read everything into this. And importantly, for people who are Jewish, why is it important that one should see one who purports to be the son of God feeding people with bread? Dare we say manna? Dare the we say that, yeah. yeah, manna in the wilderness. Right. So God gives bread. God gives meat. God gives provision. In a wild place, God feeds and sustains. And this Jesus, as he teaches, points to that reliance on God. So much so that when the disciples doubt on him and struggle with this, it, he is very clear. He says, look around you. And the, while the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests and the scribes demand signs, you actually have signs in front of you and you still don't see. You still don't see. So this is a key element of chapter six to really understand that that when, when we are presented with the living Christ doing his thing and think about what he's done in the last two chapters, immediacy, he has cast demons out of a profoundly possessed man. He has, um, by just a woman touching his clothing, healed her of a suppressing and oppressive uh, issue of blood that is has kept her from being with her own family and be able to walk in public for decades. He has raised a young girl from her deathbed. He has now fed thousands of people. And on top of that, his followers are healing and preaching and teaching in his name as well. And still the scribes and the, and the priestly class are continuing to struggle with this and say, by what authority do you do these things? And it's a tension that we're going to have to hold on to for the next few chapters, because ultimately that's the, the seed of contention that's going to take us to the place where Jesus will be condemned to death. But right now we're seeing this, this, in this rising awareness, this energy flashing around Jesus, um, like light bending around itself, this incredible awareness that what's happening here is very important. It is, it is incredibly engaging and vivifying, and uh, we need to pay attention to that. 
Oh, chapter seven. So I love this image that Jesus engages the elders um, with questions. And, and, I, and I want you, if you read chapter seven, really note the differences here because the Pharisees are arguing about traditions that have been developed from the time of Moses, not the actual law of Torah. Not the actual, not the actual 613 practices that, that were handed down at Sinai. Um, they have bound people with codes of behavior to prevent violation of the Torah. So, you know, that if if you remember back when you were a kid, um, I still don't, even though my mom has gone to glory. And I, I try to avoid stepping on cracks in the pavement, don't you? Because what happens when you step on a crack? <laughs> oh you break your mother's back right everybody knows that don't they so we avoid cracks right mm, no i never i'm sorry <laughs> no it's 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 it is absurd so we avoid cracks <laughs> and and you'll see my slide here we avoid stepping on cracks instead of caring for the old and the infirm mm -hmm. right um you've heard it said said jesus in chapter seven you've heard it said that you are to honor your father and mother, but how do you honor your father and mother when you are responsible for their care, but then you tell them that the money that had been set aside for their care has now been be declared Corbin, be declared dedicated to God so that you don't have to give it to them. It's basically you've placed it in an annuity for the temple and therefore they don't have any, any access to that support. Like you, you've basically said, you know, yeah, I know I'm supposed to have a hundred dollars, but I only have 10 because I gave 90 of it to the, to, to make sure that the capital campaign went off, you know, we're going to have a capital campaign. Please do give some money to it. But I'm, you know what I'm saying is that the idea is that, you know, you have a primary relationship to the people that God has given you to be in relationship with. And yet you use all these excuses to muddy the waters so that you don't come off making an error. And if you're worried about that, then you're really not heeding and paying attention to things. So the question of authority then becomes issue actually of a question of purity. And this is one that, you know, is a lovely thing to discuss in Bible studies, not always a great thing to have to preach on. Jesus says, there is nothing that can go into a person that pollutes. It's what comes out of us afterwards and goes into the sewer that is filth. That is a profoundly affecting thing is that where is the filthy filth coming from? Is it coming from the inside or the outside? You know, That's the important thing to note here. If we are unjust as a society, it's rising from in here, not from some exterior influence. And that is profoundly affecting because it challenges us to understand that, you know, in a time specifically in the pandemic as well, when we sanitize and wash our hands constantly, are we washing our hands before and after eating? To what end? To what purpose? You know, are we doing it to protect our neighbor, which we are, or are we doing that to basically prevent ourselves from coming off looking bad? You know, there's a there's a there's an author friend of mine from high school who uh, has written a number of of uh, of medical medical social commentary books. And one of those is called Better. Uh, his name is Atul Gawande. And he talks about, and both of you are in healthcare, so you can resonate to this, trying to get doctors to wash their hands between patients. And they've done studies and found that if you can get a doctor I'm not even talking about nurses here. If you can get a doctor to wash their hands between patients, the incidence of communicable infections within a hospital drops dramatically. But the challenge is, can you get them to understand that they are doing that as an effort to care for their patients? Why do we do the things we do? We do so that we can care for the other, which is really what Jesus is talking about. The the rules and, and the things that you're doing, they're all meant for you to care for yourself, to reserve for yourself your place before God.
in sanctity. And the sanctity that you're expressing is the sanctity that we have in the present moment. I'm telling you, we're called to be in relationship. Think about what just happened in the previous chapters, right? You know, the leper, the blind, or the 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 the, the, the leper, the blind man, the the one who is uh, who is a cripple, the one who is dead, the one who is possessed. You know, these the woman, the woman who bleeds. You know, these are all things that say Jesus chooses to be in contact with them, <laughs> demonstrating uncleanness, but yet at the same time he's bringing healing. So why do you wash? How many times do you wash your hands before and after eating? Why do you wash your hands? Which begs this moment in scripture. And I think if I have to choose two favorite moments of Jesus interacting with people in scripture, it is the Samaritan woman at the well, which I believe we meet in John. And this one, the Syrophoenician woman from the synoptic Matthew, Mark, and Luke scriptures. The Syrophoenician woman or the, the Canaanite woman sometimes referred to, um, she is a person who comes up to Jesus and begs for the healing of her daughter. And what does Jesus say in return? Do you remember? Come for the lost sheep of Israel, not for you. One does not give the bread for the children to the dogs. And the woman rejoins to him and says, even the dogs are allowed the crumbs under the table. And Jesus goes, woman, your faith has made you made your child well. <laughs> Blessed are you, basically. Mm. And it begs the question, who is Jesus here for? Now, remember that, that Christianity, before it was Christianity, began as a reform movement in Judaism. And on top of that was part of a reform of the, the reform movements in Judaism that were starting to coalesce around the transition between the fall of the, of the Herodian temple and the really the, the establishment of the synagogue worshiping culture. So the removal of the temple from, from Judaism and its practice, this, this transition period, this is when Christianity is finding its voice. And originally it was intended, and I'm putting air quotes on this because we don't have records of this, but I'm assuming based on text we have this, is that this was seen, the good news was being seen as a proclamation to Israel. What the Syrophoenician woman does in this very moment is she breaks that open. Who is Jesus actually here for? Is Jesus here only for the lost children of Israel? For the people of Israel and Judah who have been wandering and waiting and wondering when there's some, when their Messiah from God will arrive and liberate them from the oppression of the Romans and of the satraps and and client kings like Herod who have been oppressing them, or is something else happening here? Is this perhaps a good news gospel for all peoples and nations? And if it is something that is open to all, then this begs a profound question. Who is worthy? Who is the worthy person? Profoundly engaging. So we're not just dealing with who is this Jesus and who with what authority does he speak, but now is who is he here for? And we're starting to learn the answer to that, which is all of us, everybody. And I think we can give honor to the fact that humanity has been struggling with that, not only for um, the balance of our engagement with Jesus in his lifetime, but pretty much on the whole for our entire walk on this planet Earth in this particular genetic form. I mean, think about what that means. That means that God is not just for the us, the believers, the practitioners, the, the ones who subscribe to the charters of the community. But God is actually for everybody. Um, Archbishop Temple of Canterbury once said that the church is the only organization that exists for everyone who is not yet its member. It's the only club. It's the only, the only assemblage of human beings that exists for those who are not its members. But it's hard for us to be that open, isn't it, as human beings? 
And speaking of being open, we get to the healing of the deaf man. And uh, I love the story, one with a bound up tongue. So he can't speak or hear, he's deaf and mute. And we're hearing something here. Um, so when Jesus raises the, the Jairus' daughter from her deathbed, and now we hear Jesus use a word, an incantation, um, in the midst of the healing of the deaf man. And for the little girl, it's Talitha Kum, little girl, get up. And then this is Ephatha, um, which means be opened. Uh, these are ancient Aramaic, and they're Semitic um, mm -hmm. words that have been injected into a Greek gospel. So circle it, put a star on it, arrows pointing at it. After we had this conversation about Jesus being here for the whole world, we're also reminded that he is who he is. He's a particular person. He's not transcendent. He's particular in this case. So he's a universal Messiah in a particular context. So when he says Ephatha to the man, he's marking you know, that moment. And he's also reminding us and telling us you know, who's, who knows and who's invited to learn more about this story. And that's us. We're in the midst of this, this engagement. Oh, now we're up to the chapter eight scene. So we're back to the feeding of the 4,000. And Jesus is saying, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And because the disciples are both the, the straight men of the joke and also the faithful followers of Jesus, they're saying, who gave him some bread to eat? <laughs> but he's talking about yeast. Um, but the thing is, is that there is always a demand for a sign, isn't there? In this, in, in this context. So the signs for the disciples, as the, as the disciples struggle with this, we had 12 baskets left over from feeding the 5,000. We had seven baskets left over after feeding the 4,000. Can you not see these things as signifiers of what is happening in the world around us? It's the cleansing of things. It's the opening of things. And even in this context, you know, just as he's contending with the disciples, as well as the scribes and the Pharisees and the priest class and you know, the political class on who has authority to do all this stuff. He's also struggling with this, this ignorance or this blindness on behalf of his followers not to see things. You know, when are we going to get let in on this? And he says, we're going to see this by stages. So the next healing we see is of the blind man and Jesus taking um, his own spittle and dirt from the ground and making a paste and rubbing it into his eyes. And when he says, you know, let your eyes be opened, what do you see? And he says, I see lights and colors and people, but they look like trees. And then he receives his full sight. Why, after all of these dramatic healings, why would Jesus do something in partial effort? Because too often we fail to see the forest for the trees, or worse, we say, fail to see the trees for the forest. Um, by the way, you're going to hear more about that during our capital, our um, our capital, or our annual fund drive. So we're doing roots of abundance, and the main metaphor is, is uh, trees with their roots entwined. But when Jesus begins to ask these questions, it's the same questions that Herod was wondering about, isn't it? Who do people say that I am? Says Jesus. After all of these con after all these events, it's the same question as who is this Jesus that Herod was asking, and the disciples respond in the same way that Herod did in his ruminations, which are, he fears that it's Elijah returned from the dead. He fears that it's one of the great prophets of Israel risen up. He fears that it's John the Baptist returned from the dead. They're just parroting what everyone is saying. And Jesus then says to them, but who do you say that I am? And as we reach the end of chapter eight, it's really important to understand that this very midpoint of the gospel Jesus isn't just asking that question of his disciples. He's asking that question of us as well. The interesting thing about Peter's confession is it's exactly the right answer with the wrong intent. You may ask why that is. Because when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of God, and Jesus blesses him, Jesus then is excited to tell them about what it's going to take for the son of God to bring life to the world, which is to die, to lay in the tomb, and to rise again. 
to face persecution, rejection, death on the cross, an ignominious burial, an anonymous tomb that is not your own, and then to rise again. And this is something nobody wants to hear, because what is death in those days before the resurrection? If there isn't a magic miracle worker around to raise you up, dead is dead. And no one wants to see Jesus die. We're, we just got here. <laughs> Whatever here is, Jesus, we just got here. Why are you telling us this? And this is where, before we go to chapter 9 and the story of the Mount of the Transfiguration, this is where Jesus, if you will, takes all of the seven previous chapters, ties them up with a bow, and hands them to us, which is, now I'm going to tell you what it really means to be a disciple of the son of God. You're going to take up your cross and you're going to follow me. And, and that will lead us all to the kingdom of God. And oddly enough, this good news doesn't really feel like good news. And if you want to dive down into this and follow it, Dietrich Bonhoeffer did this amazing book um, it's the kind of thing you want to kind of pick up and, and keep for a Lenten read um, called literally the cost of discipleship. I highly recommend it out of all of the books that I can pull off my shelf. That's one that I've continued to go back to for over 40 years. The idea that you can, you can engage with someone who has taken on this question in the way that Jesus asks of us, are you willing to take up your cross and follow me? not Jesus's cross, our own, you know, this is, this is one of those times when we actually do have access to a bespoke tailor and the, the very, the very cross intended for us, the very burden, the yoke, if you will, that is matched to us is presented to us. Can we take that up and follow? It is profoundly challenging because, well, one, who wants to carry their own cross or a cross, or any cross. But also, what does that mean for us if we if we are following faith? Does this mean, does it beg the question of redemptive suffering? Am I supposed to suffer and, and experience crucifixion in this life so that I can be rejoicing in the next? I don't think that's the case. Remember, we're going to get to a very different ending of the gospel and a different kind of Easter than most of us are really prepared for at the end of Mark. Is it about the idea that we are here to take on a, an act of mortification of flesh? Don't think that's the case either. I think there's something more deeply and profoundly affecting. Everything we've seen up to now with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is all about an existential transformation, either a kind of radical healing that cleanses, that restores, that that repairs to to a function, to an effect, to an impact, but it's always about rest restoration of relationship, a return of a person who has been isolated from community into community. The man with a withered hand could not work. With a withered hand extended, he can now labor for his own bread, but also contribute to his community. The man who was a paralytic had to rely on a whole community to care for him. When he was no longer a paralytic, he could get up and walk and take care of himself. The man who is deaf returns to usefulness. The man who is blind returns with his sight. And let us really pay attention to the Gadarene demoniac. A man who was so broken and afflicted by possession that the best he could manage in his human skin was to live among the dead, naked and covered in filth and unable to be helped by anyone is restored and the storm that was existing in his own brain has been quieted and cast away and now he's in his right mind. So all of these stories are about a restoration. Cross, taking up the cross is about a restoration, but we have to figure out what that's gonna look like. We don't know the answer to that yet. And that's the great challenge of Mark is that, you know, it really kind of takes us up to the Mount of the Transfiguration, which we're about to climb next week and puts us at the foot of that rise and challenges us looking at that peak saying, are you willing to make the climb? Moreover, once you get up there, are you willing to come back down and tell us what you saw? So that's chapters five through eight of the gospel of Mark. 
And uh, we've done that in just about mm, 50 minutes. Did anything stand out for you or Allison or Amy? Did you see anything in that, in this set of stories that really caught your, your thoughts and your heart? Yeah. Um, I don't, Amy, did you want to go first? Oh, she's still muted. Okay. Um, it's dangerous to become famous. <laughs> it's true. No, seriously. Yeah, true, true. Well, it's um, true. Instead of being the gray man, the gray man, Jesus chose the um, route of being being out in front of everyone yep. and facing the dangers of being out in front of people. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's what we're dealing with today. Do you stand out? Do you speak your mind? Or do you want to be the gray man and hand back and hang back for a while and see what happens? Right. Um, it's part of it. Um, if you to taking, be willing to be willing to make a witness is a very profoundly yeah existentially threatening experience mm -hmm. it's just to take up a cross um it's the brave of the brave the, um you know the, the the bravest of the brave right we'll do that it's um again it's like uh do you stand out do you shrink back um uh, i think this is our struggles all the time even from you start right. school start school do you stand out and be Put yourself out there to be. Are you a front row? Are you a front row kid? Or are you a back row kid? Do you sit I'm in the back row kid? You are middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Amy? <laughs> no. Um, no. I mean, the only thing I still am pondering, I'm trying to figure out the what comes out, the clean and the unclean, and the discussion with the. Um, the Pharisees on that. Yeah. It, you know, and I wish, I wish, you know, we could, we could spend much more than an hour on that, but uh, I don't know if that would make good YouTubing. Um, but, but the challenge of, of what is, what is, here's another way to frame that, you know, clean versus unclean, which is, which is very clear to and visible to many in, in the way the scripture is presented. The aspect is what is worthy and unworthy. What is God, what does God find, you know, worthy or unworthy. And, and, you know, Allison just made this is like standing out as well. Are we willing to be exposed in that way? What we may be willing to do in the shadows, you know, go and interact with somebody who's not socially acceptable and, and hopefully give them some support and care versus standing up and talking openly about spiritual and mental health um, and saying this is worth doing. You know, you're right. It's an, it's a very profoundly engaging thing. The other thing we have to acknowledge, and we're going to talk more about this as we move from chapters nine through twelve, you know, next week, is that when that energy gets generated, it has to go somewhere. There's a scholar named Rene Girard. He came up with the idea of what he says he calls mimesis, which is when you have an individual and Allison, you, I think I love the way you nailed that, but also Amy, the way you raised the question, like, but he keeps asking this question, like, well, how do you get there? Like, what's the, is that this Jesus is starting to build energy mm -hmm. you know, in his relationships with his followers and his followers and his relationships with the people around them and community in the wider community to the wider culture that what it does, what it's starting to do is it's creating tension. And all that tension is starting to, to flash back onto Jesus. People are starting to hang those tensions on their on him, on their on their projections, their transferences onto him. Back in the day, there was a there was a concept of the scapegoat um, in the wilderness where the during during a particular season, liturgical season of in Judaism, the, the sins of the community were literally hung around the neck of a goat and the goat was driven off into the wilderness um, to take all the bad things away. And Rene Girard says, look at that and then see why we scapegoat, why we, why people blame Jesus for the controversies that have been generated in their own hearts. Um, why we, why we put on people, project on people, you know, regardless of, of what they've done, good, bad, or indifferent, but we, if we hang that on them and drive them away, they're going to take that energy away and we'll be fine. 
until we energy builds again, we have to hang it on somebody else and send them away. <laughs> so the transfiguration is actually Jesus saying, here I am. And then we're going to start testing and teaching that revealed son of God character. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. If you are watching online, please like and subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Of course, we will see you for the third week next week. And we're going to do chapters nine through 12. And Amy and Allison, thank you for being here as our as our stand-in students for folks who are watching out there in the ether. Appreciate your presence. And uh, we will see you soon. For now, take care and God bless. Very enjoyable. Thank you, Father. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>